I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Albeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. The doctrine of the Trinity is not a product of the earliest Christian period. So it becomes clear. The doctrine of the Trinity is a man-made idea. It's a compromise of religious ideas. Is there any God except our Lord Jesus Christ's God? To refute the doctrine of the Trinity, this is all you need to know and all you need to say. Since it is an undeniable scriptural fact that there is no God but his God. One simple truth uttered in one single breath, and the Trinity is utterly exposed for what it is, an idol made by men, a God which is not the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, a God never once even mentioned anywhere in the entire scriptures, a God that is the product of the minds of deluded men. This simple scriptural truth is also a fact which is so obvious that it also testifies to the extent of the delusion which results from their idolatry. This scriptural fact has been sitting there in the plain view of Trinitarians for the past 16 centuries. They didn't even notice. And if they did notice, the implications of this decisive fact did not even register in the darkness of their own minds. And I can't say this enough. Whatever God creates, Satan counterfeits. What comes first? The fake counterfeit, that is? or the true authentic. That would be the authentic. Right. But Muslims try to tell you the opposite. They try to say, well, what came after Christianity is the true authentic, and what Christianity is, is the somehow created before fake one. I will turn away from my signs those who are arrogant upon the earth without right. And if they should see every sign, they will not believe in it. And if they see the way of consciousness, they will not adapt it as a way. But if they see the way of error, they will adapt it as a way. That is because they have denied our signs and they were heedless of them. Now, when did the teachings that led to the development of the Trinity begin? Well, you might think the Old Testament. No. Well, then you might think must be the New Testament. It actually began at a Catholic Church Council meeting in the city of Nicaea. That's what led to the development of the Trinity Doctrine. Now that wasn't just 50 years after the New Testament, or 100 years, not even 150 years later after the New Testament, but it was actually in 325 AD. That's more than two centuries after the completion of the Bible. So with that background, Roman Emperor Constantine ordered, led, 
and in the end approved of what developed into the formula of three persons in one being. That's the basis of the Trinity doctrine. Now why? Because factions of Christianity couldn't agree, and it had become so hostile that it erupted into disunity in his empire. Constantine didn't even believe in the Trinity. It became part of his political campaign to unite the factions under one state religion in order to strengthen his empire. So he wasn't seeking religious truth. He was going to be sure that religion wouldn't divide his empire. So the reasons are plentiful to believe that he formed the Nicene Council strictly for political purposes. What comes first? The fake counterfeit, Thaddeus, or the true authentic? That's more than two centuries after the completion of the Bible. That's more than two centuries after the completion of the Bible. That's more than two centuries after the completion of the Bible. But there's a problem. The Trinity doctrine is hopelessly flawed and unbiblical. Why was it necessary to try to define God and Jesus Christ centuries after the Bible was completed? Do you think the Bible was hazy on the concept of the Father and Jesus? No, it's, it's not. So what actually happened? Just like in politics, the views of the majority were accepted, approved, and implemented. So Constantine got what he wanted, a more unified empire. But not true biblical teaching. In the big debate, God, Christ, the definitions were won by the majority. They won the argument. So what happened to the losing belief? Well, it was criticized. It was condemned and denounced as heresy. It was unorthodox. In this video, I want to show you a good question that you can ask Trinitarians. Pretty much everyone agrees that Jesus Christ God is the Father and the Father alone. This is true in Trinitarianism only the Father is the God of Jesus. Jesus was a Unitarian. That's something they don't like to say in Trinitarian world, although they admit it's true. Jesus was not a Trinitarian. His God was not a three-person being. Jesus was a Unitarian. Only one person was the God of Jesus, the Father alone. But here's the other thing. Jesus also was not a binatarian and is not a binatarian. The Holy Spirit is not Jesus Christ God in the doctrine of the Trinity. In the doctrine of the Trinity, the Father is the one God, Jesus is the one God, the Holy Spirit is the one God. So if that's true, how is it that the Holy Spirit is not Jesus Christ's God? You have to think about this. The argument that <clears throat> Trinitarians make concerning everyone else is that the Father is God, Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and based on that fact alone, that must mean all three are our God. That's their argument. Then why isn't this true for Jesus? If the Holy Spirit is the one God, then why isn't the Holy Spirit the God of Jesus? So if they're going to be consistent, they need to admit that the Holy Spirit is also Jesus Christ God. It appears that the Holy Spirit isn't Jesus Christ God, in the doctrine of the Trinity, and only one person is. And if you really get to thinking about this, you'll see how this really, really betrays them.
And as an added bonus, it's even the words of Jesus, because of course the Quran elsewhere says that Jesus personally prophesied Muhammad by name. Mm-hmm. Actually, Ahmed. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, then, I know Ahmed. And then, um, so yeah, I guess this wolves. this probably actually I think you're wrong. I think that when you do your your uh, gymnastics that uh-huh. Muslims like to do, which I know are perfectly legitimate, because that's how they find Muhammad in the Bible. <laughs> so I know that those tactics are perfectly legitimate. I'm, th- I'm thinking this is going to say Ahmed is a false prophet. So in Acts 1.8, we see, um, especially when we start to look back at John 14 through 16, when we realize that Jesus is talking about um, himself going away and then giving and sending a helper, right? This is the helper. This is the Holy Spirit. This is the paraclete. Um, this is the comforter, whatever you want to call this uh, Holy Spirit. That is what Jesus has been promising. Was the Holy Spirit Jesus Christ's God? But in Trinitarianism, boy, that's going to be kind of weird if you're a Trinitarian and Jesus has it that two persons are his God. He is a two person God the Father and the Holy Spirit. So what do you do? You just deny it. You deny your own reasoning on this occasion and just make up excuses why the Holy Spirit isn't Jesus Christ God. This is the kind of thing that Trinitarian doctrine leads to. Just a tangled mess. A mess of lies. And It's for that reason that, you know, these things don't get brought up in Trinitarian world. They're inconvenient. And that's really one of the most interesting things about the reasoning of Trinitarian doctrine. You know, their logic and their reasonings. The biggest thing is what they don't say. Did you know there's another problem you should understand? It's a quandary that undermines those who want to believe the Trinity. It's this. Why didn't the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul, or Jesus himself mention the Holy Spirit as a divine third person? Well, let's start with Paul. Notice the greetings in the letters that he wrote. It's the same salutation, only minor variations. Did you know these appear in every single epistle that he wrote? Did you notice the amazing part? He never includes the Holy Spirit. Whether it's a letter to the Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, or even a personal letter to Timothy, he mentions God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord in his opening salutation. But he never mentions the Spirit as a separate being or personage. Now think about that for a moment. If God were a trinity, certainly Paul the one who wrote most of the New Testament, would have understood this and taught the concept of a triune God. But the Holy Spirit is always left out of His greetings. What an oversight! If the Spirit was actually a co-equal with God the Father in Christ, how could He leave that out? Because there is no Trinity. In fact, Peter did exactly the same in his greetings. The same omission. Neither of them attempts to explain the Trinity or the Holy Spirit. Why? They didn't consider the Holy Spirit a divine, separate being equal with the Father and Jesus Christ. They followed Jesus. He taught them. One Christian website presented the question, Can you become a Christian if you deny the Trinity? They answered, No! If you don't believe in the Trinity, then you don't understand who God is. Second, you couldn't possibly understand who Christ is. 
To deny the Trinity is to wrongly understand the true gospel. Now, by that standard, since Cardinal O'Connor said he didn't begin to understand the Trinity, he wouldn't be a Christian. Even more shocking, Jesus himself wouldn't be considered a Christian. He said the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. He didn't say, worship the three-in-one triune God. In fact, Christ said, my Father is greater than I. Not equal. Well, how could that be? If they're co-equal, if they're, they're one yet somehow distinct, well, how can I know the true God if the Trinity is such a mystery that I can't even begin to understand, but I have to accept? Is understanding who God is that important anyway? Yes. Your worship, your salvation, even your eternal life depends on it. Jesus emphasized the significance. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Realizing the truth is critical to your relationship with God and your future. Don't be deceived by a false notion that says you can't understand. There's so much to say about this subject and this erroneous doctrine of the Trinity, much more than I can possibly cover today. But you can understand. Biblical scholars are well aware of the problems and history of the three-in-one Trinity, the so-called triune God. Two prominent theology professors wrote, it is understandable that the importance placed on the doctrine is perplexing to many lay Christians and students. Nowhere is it clearly and unequivocally stated in Scripture. How can it be so important if it's not explicitly stated in Scripture? The doctrine of the Trinity developed gradually after the completion of the New Testament. It's a fact. The Trinitarian dogma was invented hundreds of years after Christ. By 451, with the approval of the Pope, debate on the matter was no longer tolerated. To speak against the Trinity was now blasphemy. If you did, you could be sentenced to mutilation or even death. People turned on each other. Thousands were maimed and slaughtered because of a difference of opinion. But even that didn't stop the controversy over the doctrine of the Trinity. And that controversy continues even today. Exactly how could God be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, supposedly existing in three distinct but equal persons? The late New York Archbishop, Cardinal John O'Connor, said, We know that it is a very profound mystery which we don't begin to understand. But should it be that way, that you can't even understand God? Does it even matter? Absolutely. It impacts your eternal life. The idea of the Trinity is a core teaching of mainstream Christianity. But do you realize that it obstructs your understanding and relationship with the Father and your Savior, Jesus Christ? We've seen how Emperor Constantine orchestrated the Trinity doctrine to unite his Roman Empire. The Illustrated Bible Dictionary admits... It is not a biblical doctrine in the sense that any formulation of it can be found in the Bible. A council of men concocted it and came to consensus. And if you follow biblical teachings, they brand you a heretic. Teachers of the Trinity ignore critical information that, that you should know when it comes to this false idea. Don't let them fool you. It may sound religious but it doesn't originate in the Bible. Now here's something startling found in the introduction of the book, History of Christianity. The author goes on to say that the authentic Christianity of Jesus' disciples was changed by the Church of Rome into the incomprehensible dogma of the Trinity. The connection between the teachings of pagan Greek philosophers and the Trinity is so strong, 
So no wonder the Apostle Paul wrote to us, Beware of hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of the world, rather than on Christ. Does your church teach a deceptive idea based on something other than the Bible? Don't believe that story. Did you know Christ Himself never spoke of the Holy Spirit as a divine third person? Instead, over and over again, He spoke only of the relationship between Himself and God the Father. He never made a similar statement about Himself and the Holy Spirit. No wonder Scripture plainly tells us, Truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Just because the Trinity is the most widely accepted and revered doctrine of traditional Christianity, it doesn't mean that you should blindly accept it. It just isn't scriptural. Now, I can't cover all the aspects today, so I'd like to help you discover the real truth about the Trinity doctrine. Order your personal copy of Is God a Trinity? What really becomes clear is the fact that the Trinity is incredibly confusing. The Bible itself tells us there's no godly connection, for God is not the author of confusion. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote that you need to understand God, and not only understand Him, but that you can have a special personal relationship with the Father and with Christ. For I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that He may grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation, of insight into mysteries and secrets in the deep and intimate knowledge of Him. Christianity.com says that you are not a Christian if you don't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. But then it goes on to say that no one fully understands it. It's a mystery and a paradox. It also quotes a saying, If you try to explain the Trinity, you will lose your mind. The Trinity is impossible to understand. Honest pastors, ministers, and priests will even admit that there's no way to comprehend it. If theologians know it's beyond the understanding of men, then how can they know for sure that they got it right in the first place? You will surely find the most intense of the people in animosity toward the believers to be the Jews and those who associate others with Allah. And you will find the nearest of them in affection to the believers, those who say, we are Christians. That is because among them are priests and monks, and because they are not arrogant. You know, Jesus even helps us understand the meaning of the relationship between Him and the Father when in John 17 where He prays and He says, the Father and I are one. But He's talking about a relationship. He doesn't say, I am the Father because He's praying to Him. And He doesn't say, the Father is me, but He says, we are one. He then goes on to explain that He's asking God to help all the disciples to come into a relationship of oneness with them that's like the relationship they have, which is very important. It shows us this oneness is a is a relationship. Now that's not like a human relationship, it's in the spirit world. So it's a type of oneness that's even more profound than anything we can experience now. But it is a relationship between the Father and the one that we know as Jesus Christ. And in fact, uh, Gary, that one verse in chapter 17 of John, Jesus did say to the Father, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. And right there you have the entire picture of the Father and Jesus Christ, and Christ is explaining it, 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 it's wrapped up in one verse right there. So you see the unity of the Father and the Son. He includes yes. us in that unity. Yes. We're supposed to have that. So you begin to, to kind of get the idea we're looking at a grouping. We're looking at maybe a congregation. We're looking at a church. We're looking at really a family. The family really defines what God's all about. The Trinity teaching, when you do understand it, and admittedly it's hard to understand with the wording that's come down to us, but when you do understand what it is saying, it is a closed system. Uh, there is no entry of anyone into it. You have the teaching in the Trinity of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. It's a closed triune Godhead that is incomprehensible to understand, much less explain. And uh, 
salvation, which the scriptures plainly speak to, uh, is a process of bringing many sons to glory. And with the Trinity teaching, those, those sons cannot share in the glory in a family relationship with the Father. So if you can understand family, then you can really understand what God's all about. I hope you've come to see that the Trinity is a deceitful counterfeit that hinders your relationship with the Father and with Jesus Christ. If not, don't you owe it to yourself to look into the numerous critical questions surrounding the Trinity? Remember, it's God's will for you to truly understand Him and to know Him. Islam teaches a counterfeit morality. According to Matthew 13, chapter 37th verse, the one who sowed the good seed is son of man. According to Revelation 14, chapter 14th verse, Christ, like a son of man, came with a sharp sickle in harvest period. In the same way, in Daniel 7, chapter 13th verse, we will see the one like a son of man. We need to carefully observe the verse, it is like a son of man, not son of man. We can only recognize the Christ in the second coming. We can only find the same featured seeds in the harvest. It is our foolishness to expect same seed in the harvest. That means it is foolish if you want to see same Christ whom we see in pictures with long beard, and hair, wearing long shirt, having wounds on his palm. This is hard teaching, but it is according to Bible. Not with the outer form of Christ, but by comparing with deeds, teaching, and with the lifestyle of Christ, we should recognize the Christ in second coming. Hebrews 3, um, 7 and 8. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of the testing in the wilderness. Again, we see the Holy Spirit says something, meaning the Holy Spirit speaks. Has the time not come for those who have believed that their hearts should become humbly submissive at the remembrance of Allah? and what has come down of the truth. And let them not be like those who were given the scripture before, and a long period passed over them, so their hearts hardened, and many of them are defiantly disobedient. Christ mm -hmm. is saying, mm -hmm. examine me, examine my, my statements, examine this Bible, right? And Christians do that. We examine the Bible. We have te textual criticism. We have source criticism. We have uh, historical criticisms of all of these types of things. We're, we are asking, seeking, knocking. We're trying to find the absolute most authentic Bibles and truths and all the types of things. Where we're, we're not afraid. Absolutely. We're not scared. So this better fits Christians who openly claim to believe in Jesus, and then the paraclete comes and he uncovers, he brings the light that actually they don't believe in him. They, their disbelief is a hidden sin that is then exposed. And they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. But another was made to resemble him to them. But another was made to resemble him to them. But another was made to resemble him to them. They have no knowledge of it except the following of assumption. The false image of the Messiah, Christ, the most common images seen in many homes and churches, is the image of Caesar Borgia, son of Pope Alexander VI, who employed Leonardo da Vinci, his son Caesar's gay lover, to paint Caesar as the Christ. 
Last time you saw me, I actually came clean and told you that I wasn't the real Jesus. I also told you that I was created to make certain populations happy and comfortable. Well, I am glad to see that many of you are loyal and enjoy strong delusions and still want me as your savior. <laughs> wow! What idiots! But another was made to resemble him to them. They have no knowledge of it except the following of assumption. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. With all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belonged to this world. He ordered the people of the world to make a great statue of the first beast, who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. who belong to this world. He ordered the people of the world to make a great statue of the first beast, who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. Reprobate according to Jeremiah 6 verse 30 simply means rejected. And in context of a person, it's referring to an individual who has been rejected by God and therefore beyond the hope of salvation. That means there are people in this world that can no longer be saved. The Bible would describe them on a spectrum that ranges from sodomites all the way to false prophets. And despite what the Calvinists teach, reprobates are not born, they're made. According to the Bible, we all start off as unsaved people until the gospel is given unto us. Some believe, some don't. But then there's a subcategory of people who not only reject the gospel, but actually become vehemently adversarial towards God. They begin to hate Him and don't want to retain Him in their knowledge. God will then assist them in their quest to reject Him and remove their ability to believe along with their moral compass. The Bible says that they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. These are people who have crossed the event horizon of the hope of salvation and are eternally damned. That is the recompense of the enemies of Allah, the fire. For them therein is the home of eternity, as recompense for what they, of our verses, were rejecting. Isaiah 65, 10, but they were the ones who rebelled and they grieved his Holy Spirit. So he, right, the Holy Spirit became an enemy to them, became an enemy to them. Non-persons can't become an enemy to you. And thus have we made for every prophet an enemy from among the criminals. But sufficient is your Lord as a guide and a helper. Are those the fruits those good fruits, Thaddeus. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. O prophet, fight against the disbelievers and the hypocrites and be harsh upon them. And their refuge is hell and wretched is the destination. Christians and Jews and polytheists who see the message and disbelief and reject the commands of the Quran will go to hell and are the worst of creation. <laughs> 
I love this verse. As everybody already knows, I am certainly going to hell for all the beautiful things that I do for the religion of Islam. Did I not enjoin upon you, O children of Adam, that you not worship Satan? For indeed, he is to you a clear enemy. In 1 Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, right? So the Holy Spirit expressly says, aka speaks, right? And the Holy Spirit prophesies, saying that in the end times, many people will be led astray by deceitful spirits and teachings of demons demons and then the paraclete comes and he uncovers he brings the light that actually they don't believe in him they their disbelief is a hidden sin that is then exposed and also remember he's supposed to prove that they're disbelievers in jesus do you have to prove that jews and pagans disbelieve in jesus why do you have to prove it they openly say it but christians now they claim to believe in jesus that it makes sense that you would prove that actually they don't believe in him and expose them as being disbelievers. So by that criteria, we can determine that the paraclete is supposed to expose and prove that uh, Christians, those who claim to believe in Jesus, actually don't. And remember, according to Clark, it's supposed to confuse them. Now, Christians who claim to believe in Jesus, it would confuse them when they would be convicted of disbelief, but not so much Jews who hear it all the time, you disbelieve in Jesus, right? No, rather the world generally, uh, collectively, is being exposed. That party is collectively being accused. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Jesus makes a distinction between speaking a word against the Son of Man and speaking against the Holy Spirit. Remember, uh, the paraclete is uh, convicting the world regarding this. And just a recap of a previous video, we discussed that the word for convict, as Raymond Brown points out, um, it is a question of bringing the merciless light of truth to bear on guilt. The word convict there means to like expose with a fiery nature. Have the people been amazed that we revealed revelation to a man from among them? saying, warn mankind and give good tidings to those who believe that they will have a firm precedence of honor with their Lord. But the disbelievers say, indeed, this is an obvious magician. If you really want to know if someone's lying to you, don't listen to what they do say. Listen to what they don't say and don't do. And then you'll see more clearly. You know how when you watch in court and there's, there's a liar, a criminal, on the witness stand and he's trying to lie his way out of being proven guilty? And his defense lawyer is trying to spin doctor things like that too. Do you ever notice how they're trying to draw attention away from the facts? Both the defense lawyer and the defendant. They're trying to, they're trying to, you know, Draw your attention away from the facts. Disregard those facts. And they're, and they're trying to spin doctor a different picture so that you'll find him not guilty. And that's what happens in Trinitarian world. They try to get you to hone in on, you know, all the stuff they're babbling about so that you don't look and see all these other things, these other facts. Because when you do see them, the verdict is clear. Guilty. My point is, when you're authentic, you want to be examined. Mm -hmm. When you're mm -hmm. fake, you shun away examination, right?
you'll find out that there are more contradictions. And to a discerning mind, to a discerning eye, you can actually tell the difference, which one's genuine and which one's the counterfeit, right? It's not that hard. The counterfeit does not want to be examined, Thaddeus, right? The, the, the person selling you the, the fake Oakleys, the Folkleys, he doesn't want you to examine them. He just says, look, it's a great deal, $7, take it. Would you like to suggest another god for us to serve, O oh, idolater? Perhaps you like your god better and insist we serve your god rather than our Lord's God. The Lord's God was not and is not a three-person being. Yet you insist we serve your God. Are you out of your mind? If you thought the only true God was something other than the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, then you are just a man who is truly drowning in his own madness. Is there any God except our Lord's God? The answer is obviously no, there is not. There is only one God, and that one God is the God of Jesus. It is he who sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth to manifest it over all religion. Although those who associate others with Allah dislike it. In their system, this man, this prophet Jesus, who is now in heaven, never having died, plays a key role in the end times because he will return from heaven. Without dying, he will come back when Allah sends him back. Now the question to ask is why would Allah want to send Jesus back? He has a lot of prophets to pick from. Why does He send Jesus back? Answer, so that when He shows up, He can correct all the Christians who have misunderstood who He is. So this religion will be a rebellion against all these religions. Agree completely? So, you know, as long as we replace the word with religion with what, um, you know, is a knowledge system, I agree with the sentiment here. This will be a, re a rebellion against all these religions. And, and I love that idea too because, see, I like this um, at least uh, from, from, from what I'm reading here is that Osho's not being like, oh, well, we should accept all religions and love all religions. No, this is a rebellion against all the religions, that all other religions will resist it, that it will be the death of all the religions, and that it will, it will not carry their work further. It will stop their work completely and start a new work, the real transformation of man. One simple truth in one single breath has the power to annihilate 10,000 lies of men. But such are lies. They are nothing at all. Nothing but the devil's mirages in their parched wilderness designed to mock men and lead them away from the oasis of God's living water. And liars always will deny any obvious truth which they deem to be inconvenient to their self-serving needs, won't they? And their lies will increase, and they will heap up more lies upon lies, for they are a rebellious house, and they love their idolatry far too much to seize from their wickedness and serve the living God of our Lord Jesus. And so they store up wrath for themselves on the day of wrath. Yes, by simply knowing this simple truth, every true child of God knows the Trinity is necessarily false. A lie of men, a God manufactured by men, the tutor of all their lies, their own man-made dead and lifeless idol master whom they serve. And so they are slaves to the product 
of their own imaginations and refuse to turn from their idolatry to serve the living and true God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who delivers us from the coming wrath. It is the nature of the sons of disobedience to cherish serving gods of their own making rather than serving the living and true God of our Lord. Yes, my friends, the living and true God of Jesus can indeed so easily destroy this idol of men with one simple truth in one single breath. Repent of your idolatry before it is too late. The judge is at the door. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day of Christ's return will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed. The man of sin is revealed. The man of sin is revealed. The son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. According to Revelation, the Antichrist is not a secular power. This isn't about barcodes and credit cards or computers named the beast. This is about worship. This is a religious power. God is not trying to pick on anyone, but he's simply telling us that there is a religion that multitudes are following that is not adequately reflecting who God is.